Hello, and thank you for joining us for this webinar sponsored by ASEA Biosciences, which is now part of Agilent Technologies. My name is Yama Abasi, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before I introduce our speaker for today, allow me to share a bit about Agilent Technologies and the products we offer for cell analysis. Agilent is a trusted leader in life sciences, clinical research, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets, providing laboratories with instruments, services, consumables, applications, and expertise to enable our customers to gain the insights they seek. ASEA is one of the newest additions to Agilent cell analysis divisions, uh, which includes Seahorse, Luxel, and also Biotech, which was recently acquired. Agilent's rapidly growing cell analysis portfolio enables deeper, more reliable insights across a variety of cell analysis applications where investigators and drug developers seek to understand complex cellular environments and interactions, including cell fate, fitness, and function. Our comprehensive Comprehensive cell analysis tools are critically important in various investigation fields, such as cancer, inflammation, immuno immunology, infectious diseases, and you'll find out today, immune oncology. Even though the origins of the immunotherapy field can be traced back to the beginnings of the 19th century, Modern immunotherapy, as we understand it, had its origins about a decade ago with the introduction of various antibodies, such as those that blocked immune checkpoints, including CTLA-4, PD-1, and PDL-1, as well as engineered antibodies such as bites and bispecifics and oncolytic viruses. Adoptive cell therapies such as TILs and engineered T cells have propelled the field of cancer ter therapy to a whole other level. The ability to harness and co-opt the exquisite specificity, memory, and adaptability of the immune system to achieve better efficacy is something that the field is truly striving to achieve. We do see and envision that there is an important role for non-perturbing, real-time functional assays that are predictive and uh, play an important role in improving the efficacy of these new treatments and also for understanding the underlying toxicities. The Excelligence instruments offered by ACR Biosciences is composed of a number of instruments which primarily differ in the throughput that they offer. The standard Excelligence instrument utilizes special microtida plates with embedded, with embedded impedance biosensors. Our latest addition is the eSight system, where we have combined impedance biosensor technology together with live cell imaging capability, which will be covered in today's webinar. It now um, gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael Overstreet. Dr. Overstreet obtained his Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Engineering and his PhD in Molecular Microbiology and Immunology from Johns Hopkins University. He performed his postdoctoral training at the University of Rochester Medical Center at the Center for Vaccine Biology and Immunology. Subsequent to his postdoctoral training, Dr. Overstreet had held group leader positions at multiple biopharma companies. He is currently associate principal scientist in oncology discovery at AstraZeneca. Before I ha hand over the mic to Mike, I would like to remind you that this webinar is interactive and that there will be question and answer period immediately following the talk. You will notice on your screen that you can and in fact, you should, please type in your questions during the presentation in the Q&A field, as this helps ensure that we get as many questions as possible. Also, there's a link 
to some resources on the screen. Please feel free to click at those during or after the presentation. With that, thank you. And Dr. Overstreet, please take it away. Okay. Thank you, Yama, for the intro, and thanks for the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing to develop um, some models of anti-tumor T-cell responses uh, that are HLA and peptide-restricted, um, with ultimately the goal of having a robust and reliable platform for testing candidate therapeutics um, alone and, and in combination. Um, so I'll start off here today with a little bit of a rationale and description of the approach that we've taken uh, and why we think it's worth the effort. And then I'll cover some example data that highlights a few of our key learnings around the parameters that are really important to consider in these, in these kinds of assays. And then finally, we'll show some of the learnings uh, from our recent evaluation using a multiplex readout um, of, the, of the e site that, that, that Yama just alluded to. So if we start out with our, our rationale, um, what we want to try and, and understand is how we can best uh, try and model the cognate interactions uh, between a T cell and a tumor cell. And, and by cognate, I mean those um, governed by the T cell receptor and the peptide HLA complex. And, and this is really critical um, because anti-tumor T cells are really the keystone uh, for the vast majority of immunotherapeutic approaches uh, being used and tested right now for the treatment of cancer. Um, CAR T cells are certainly revolutionizing treatment paradigms and some of the hematological malignancies. Um, but in solid tumors, given the antigenic heterogeneity, we believe that in these endogenous T cell responses to tumor antigens are still likely to be fundamental to the success of even these adoptive cell therapies. And yet, given the uh, huge worldwide investment uh, in cancer immunotherapy, our ability to study these interactions between a human T cell and a human tumor cell is actually quite limited. Um, so what exactly do we mean by this? Um, so while all cells in the body um, they must respond to a pretty complex array of signals coming from their extracellular environment, the, the memory T lymphocytes are among the most dynamic of cells, um, constantly traversing nearly all tissues in the body scanning the surface of these cells in search of their cognate antigen. Um, and when they find that the signal uh, that comes through their T cell receptor initiates a cascade uh, that results in the activation of the cell. And what this activation looks like will really depend on a um, combination of other signals that, that the cell receives. So in addition to the T cell re receptor, um, They'll also have uh, a network of signals coming through both positive co-stimulation and, and, and regulatory receptors or checkpoint re receptors here, as well as the cytokine milieu, um, uh, just to name a few here. What we, what we might call simply uh, activation of a cell is actually the, the net result of a much more rich and complex network of signals. It must be carefully deciphered inside the cell. So for this reason, uh, it's critical to study these cells in the proper context if we hope to extract any, any meaningful um, uh, and, and relevant conclusions from our studies. So over the past half century or so, researchers found an array of means by which to make a T cell respond. And I list a few of them here, uh, ranging from compounds such as uh, four ball esters, uh, calcium ionophores, and, uh, and, and, and lectins, um, to bacterial enterotoxins, to antibodies, to foreign HLA, all the way down to a uh, cognate peptide being presented within the proper HLA context. Now, all these different means of stimulation all have their place in the toolbox but we need to be cognizant of not over-interpreting their role because while some can generate robust responses, they tell you more about the capacity of a T cell to respond to a stimulus, not necessarily how it will respond in a physiologically relevant way. Um, and I'll show you hopefully over the next, uh, uh, over the process of this webinar, that even with the per precise stimulation of the peptide HLA complex, 
still, still quite easy to oversaturate your responsiveness and throw your, your signaling um, out of whack in a way that you won't have any, any kind of a dynamic window to study any sort of a, a therapeutically relevant uh, stimulation. So um, studying antigen-specific T cell responses using peptide HLA uh, give us the best chance, I think, for studying the relevant effects of checkpoint blockade and a, a immune agonist in the context that we would that they might actually be seen with, in, inside the, the body. Uh, in an ex vivo setting, we, we can control that signal strength uh, to, to some extent by varying our antigen concentration uh, or using altered peptide ligands in a way. Um, however, these, uh, th these studies are not without their challenges, um, the first of which being uh, the diversity within the HLA or the human leukocyte antigen. The most poly polymorphic gene set within, uh, within our genome with in the order of two to 4,000 different alleles at each of our HLA, A, B, and C genes. Um, so that creates significant uh, practical problems of being able to identify um, individual people with a given HLA um, and to uh, I, I identify peptides within a given HLA. Now, it's not entirely random uh, within the North American population and Western European, about 40%. Um, express HLA A201, and we're going to uh, try and leverage this uh, within our studies. But there are a number of other challenges of identifying exactly who these individuals are and what peptides they respond to um, that really uh, can limit the utility of, of these assays for uh, uh, across a wide variety of research purposes. So what do we do? Um, so we chose to build our models around antiviral T cells, uh, which are readily available from healthy donors um, and would allow us to utilize primary T cells um, uh, with a minimal exposure time uh, to the in vitro culture plastic uh, that would help limit some of the caveats associated with a long-term culture. But as I mentioned before, uh, we're utilizing uh, uh, peptides that have been shown to be presented in HLA A201. Uh, so we first screened uh, our donor pools for expression of HLA2 uh, by, by flow cytometry. And then those that were positive, we screened them for six HLA A201 restricted peptides from three different uh, common viral pathogens being Epstein-Barr virus, influenza A, and cytomegalovirus. Um, these six peptides uh, are, 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 are well characterized for being presented in A201 um, and are reasonably, have a reasonably high prevalence within the human population. So we started screening our, our donors for reactivity um, to these peptides. And this involved incubation of PBMC uh, for one week with individual peptides and then looking for um, what looked like effector cells uh, within the CD8 T cell compartment of these PBMC. And then we can see with these example flow cytometry plots here that if we look at co-expression of two markers of activation in this context, TIM3 and CD25, uh, we see cells cultured with um, and different peptides show different levels of effector cells uh, within their population. So compared to no peptide, uh, this donor seems to respond to these four different peptides here, GLC, GIL, NLV, and, and CLG, not so much to these other two. And so using this kind of approach, uh, we, we, we created a catalog of, of, of donors, each with a, a unique uh, fingerprint of which peptides that they respond to. And using this, we can then uh, re recall donors um, and use them for um, use in our, 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 our cytotoxicity assays. And in order to do this, we have to expand these antiviral T CD8 T cells uh, very much in the same way that we screen the cells, just culturing our, our PBMC with peptide, this time with the addition of, of IL-2 for one week. And at the end of the one week, we quantify our effector cells using flow cytometry again. So if we look at our CD3 positive cells uh, that are then CD8 positive, 
um, we, we see a, a very nice population of cells in this red box here uh, that co-express uh, CD25 and TIM3. And if we look at the frequency of this population within the total PBMC in that whole well, or flask rather, um, that com composes about 24% of all the cells. Um, so we get a, a robust proliferation um, and a relative enrichment of these antiviral T cells that uh, co-express other markers of, of therapeutic interest, as we see in these histograms below. They express uh, in red uh, CD137, PD1, uh, HLADR, TIGIT, um, ICOS. Um, they look like bona fide effector cells, and they bind tetramers um, that, uh, that are specific to the peptide that, that they were expanded against. Uh, and if we look for three different uh, specificities here, each of, this dot, each of these dots represent a, a single a single donor uh, who's been who was shown to be reactive and then had T cells cultured uh, with those individual peptides and touchmer reactive cells um, showed those relative frequencies with, with, within the, the total PBMC. And so we can get upwards of up to 50% uh, of every cell in that flask um, is an antigen specific T cell. And so this can is a means of generating a a good and rich pot of antiviral T cells. So the second key element of, a, of our cytotoxicity assay uh, is the target cell. Uh, so most cytotox cytotoxicity assays utilize peptide pulse target cells or cells that naturally express the, the target antigen. So peptide pulsing of target cells um, however, can result in uncontrolled waning pre presentation of peptide uh, as the peptide starts falling off the HLA. And then during an extended co-culture that, 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 that we are most interested in, um, you really get uncontrolled antigen presentation. Um, so we wanted stable presentation of our target antigen. So our, our approach was simply to uh, overexpress a concatamer of the six viral peptides that we screened our donors against, uh, stitched together by linkers and encoded inside a lentivirus um, that also had a GFP tag. And so if we take a HLA A201 positive tumor cell um, and transduce it with a lentivirus um, that then forces this cell to express uh, this polypeptide, um, this polypeptide is then cut up in, in the proteasome. These peptides are loaded on the HLA A201 and presented on the surface of the cell for presentation to T cells. And all six of these peptides get presented and can then be, so this target cell can then be used as something of a, a universal target cell for T cells uh, expanded against any of the six um, peptide specificities uh, that we screened for. So the third key element um, of a cytotoxicity is the platform against which we are going to utilize to measure the tumor cell killing. So we know that T cells have many potentially redundant m mechanisms um, by which to kill a target cell, and, uh, and often surrogates of cytotoxicity are used. Um, but given that we don't know what kind of a mechanism is critical in any given context, we, we really want a direct measurement of cytotoxicity. Because if we can show a given therapeutic intervention uh, or therapeutic intervention may increase a, a surrogate readout, say, production of interferon gamma. Um, but if we don't know that interferon gamma was in, important for killing in, in that assay, or it was producing enough interferon gamma already and it wasn't, it wasn't a limiting variable by increasing the amount of of the, the cytokine were not actually going to affect killing of the tumor cells. So there are a variety of different ways uh, to measure a direct readout of, of tumor cell cytotoxicity, and I've listed a few examples here. Um, the first two tend to be uh, a bit labor intensive, uh, and most importantly, they have fixed endpoints. Um, we are most imp uh, interested in a uh, and something that not have a fixed endpoint and something that can measure in real time, and we opted for uh, impedance-based measurement, primarily because it's uh, 
a label-free platform, and it provides a, an objective readout um, in the impedance um, that comes out of the system. It also gives you uh, semi-continuous and real-time data, non-destructive, and um, also importantly, it is pretty hands-off. So I'll just give you a, a quick overview of the technology for, uh, in case you're unfamiliar with it, the Excelligence uh, is an instrument that um, it measures uh, electrical resistance across electrodes at the bottom of a tissue culture well. Um, these plates, special plates, are coated in gold-plated electrodes, and the instrument will periodically send an electrical pulse across those electrodes and measure the resistance uh, in that circuit. Um, and, and we'll read this out as a, a measurement of impedance. Um, now, if you have adherent tumor cells growing on top of your electrodes, it's more difficult for these ions to uh, complete that circuit, and it results in an increase in electrical resistance in that well. Um, and this is read out on the instrument as an increase in impedance. Um, and so in the context of a, a cytotoxicity assay, uh, this is, is leveraged by plating tumor cells uh, that cover your uh, electrodes here in step one um, and create something of a confluent monolayer that as these cells adhere and spread uh, and begin pr pr proliferating, um, you, you get an increase in your impedance signal here. Um, and once you have something of, of a plateau, you can add your non-adherent uh, effector cells, which will then begin killing tumor cells. As the tumor cells begin to die, they're no longer adherent, um, and, the elect uh, and your impedance um, signal will drop. Um, the, one of the very nice things about the system uh, and the, the setup in general is that effector cells, T cells and K cells typically, uh, are not adherent, so they contribute very little to no signal in, in the assay. So this gives actually a very clean, uh, um, clean uh, signal. And we've used this uh, kind of setup for a variety of different cytotoxicity assays. Uh, I'll show you a couple examples here. We use it for ADCC, or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity with NK cells. Uh, we, we show it with CAR-T-mediated killing, with T-cell clones, uh, allogeneic T-cell responses, as well as antigen-specific T-cell responses using antiviral T-cells I'm talking about today. Uh, just one quick technical note. Um, the impedance that comes off the system is reported as a cell index. Um, and in this example here, we have killing here in this red line. Uh, there are algorithms within the software that, that can convert these values uh, into percent cytolysis values. So, so it's something that will increase over time. Um, and that's how I'll be reporting my uh, re results in the rest of the webinar as an increase in cytolysis over time, but all the underlying data is based on a change in, in cell index that, that drops over time as tumor cells are being killed. So um, our cytotoxicity assay, as I, I, I built all the pieces um, for you thus far, will be a, a one-week expansion of our pre-screened donor PBMC with a single viral peptide and some IL-2. And after the one week, the effector cells within this mixed population are then quantified uh, by flow cytometry and then added onto our uh, tumor cells that express or don't express viral peptides that are, have, have been pre-plated in an excelligence plate. So if we jump right in, um, we see that when we use target cells in, in the left-hand column here, transduce with viral peptides, we get a nice titratable killing of the tumor cells from four different T cell specificities, uh, each of these from, from, from four different human donors. And, and within the, the, uh, the plot here, you see uh, two lines just of the same color representing uh, duplicate wells, the, the different line colors being the different uh, E to T or effector to target ratios. So with a fixed number of tumor cells in the well, Increasing E to T ratio means increasing numbers of T cells added to those wells. So we, we can see in, in this first line, we, we get a nice titration of killing that increases over time. 
at our highest E to T's here at four and two, and then it titrates down. And, and compare these responses to parental tumor cells uh, that do not express the viral peptides. We, we don't get any killing here. So um, one of the first things I wanted to point out is our time scale here. Um, these, I'm showing data here for um, 100 hours. This is actually 100, not 1,000. That's an extra zero from this over here. Um, but we typically add our T cells about 24 hours after we played our tumor cells, and we get about three days' worth of killing curves. So you notice that the first 24 to 40 hours are pretty dynamic in these assays. Um, and you contrast this to uh, some more traditional cytotoxicity assays, which, which only last four to six hours or possibly overnight, often due to uh, technical reasons. Um, but these longer time points allow us to use a, a much lower E to T ratio, um, and that longer time period will allow for crosstalk between T cells and tumor cells in a way that might uh, approximate something of the in vivo environment. And the second thing to point out is the, the low E to T ratios that we're using here. I'm only showing a few examples, uh, but we consistently show uh, a saturating response around E to T of two or four, um, and then uh, we, we, we lose responsiveness around 0 0.2 or so. Um, and this is not actually a, a huge range, um, which, depending on your perspective, could be good or bad. Um, uh, good that we can pretty easily cover the whole range of responses within a, a given assay. Um, but if you're not familiar with the, the, these ratios, it could be pretty easy to miss. Um, so the, the reason we built this you know, platform is, is for testing candidate therapeutics. Um, so to start out with uh, um, our, our first test, we, we test an anti pdl one antibody. Um, and I'll show you data here from a single donor. Um, so while we can get robust anti-tumor responses, uh, comparing the black line and the pink line here with wells treated with anti pd one we actually don't see any difference. Um, uh, perhaps maybe at this very low, at the low E to T, you might see a little bit of, of an increase, but this is not exactly what we were hoping for. So this is certainly disappointing at first um, because our whole goal was to have, have a wide a dynamic range here, but even at suboptimal E to T's, we don't see much increase here. So um, that just told us that we weren't quite done yet. So this brings us to our next section, so our how we uh, optimize and, uh, and further develop these assays. So. Um, if we go back to some basic immunology principles about how a T cell recognizes its peptide in the HLA, there are a couple other variables that will directly impact uh, the, the stimulus strength um, for a given T cell, independent of the effector to, to target ratio, which is, is more of a, a population variable. Um, and the first of these being the, the peptide antigen density on the surface of the cell. So this is typically modulated in assays by, by titrating peptide, but we limited ourselves somewhat in that context because we wanted a target cell that stably expressed the peptides. What we did is we, we, we tried to modulate this antigen density by changing the promoter uh, driving the expression of the lentiviral insert. Because we had a GFP tag on our, our viral peptide transgene, we, we could estimate the, the the peptide density by looking at GFP expression. And when we compare GFP expression on our, our first generation uh, target cells here in red, show high GFP, and if we switch and use a weaker promoter, uh, we get this blue histogram here. So we got about a tenfold re reduction in GFP MFI, which we thought was promising. Um, so we next tested it in our cytotoxicity assay to see with this lower antigen density uh, if if we started getting more suboptimal killing. And if we look, if we, start, if we compare curves now that have high antigen uh, or low antigen being expressed by our tumor cells or high GFP and low GFP, across four E to T ratios here, we can now see that clearly the, the, the lower presentation of antigen uh, 
led to a, 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 mo a more difficult time for the T cells to kill these cells, and we, and we got a, a dramatically lower uh, amount of killing, particularly at these uh, more suboptimal E to T ratios here of, of around one. So this was this was encouraging, um, but the, the next actual test was does this matter for checkpoint blockade? And so if we revisit the the, the same donor data that I showed you before, where with a uh, high level of antigen, we get pretty robust killing and no window for an anti-PDL1 treatment. If we then look at the effects of low antigen uh, combined with anti-PDL1, now we start to see some separation of these curves, uh, where at you know, these intermediate E to T ratios, we have a much slower killing, uh, though it does. Uh, in the absence of checkpoint blockade, though it does eventually reach nearly 100%, uh, this killing is a lot more rapid uh, with the anti pdl one treatment. Cases where our killing plateaus um, with lower E to T's, we, we can achieve higher plateaus with pdl one blockade. Um, but at the lowest E to T's, it still does require a critical number of T cells to, to clear those tumor cells out of the well, but now we're beginning to see some daylight in between these curves, and uh, so we're we thought we were on the, the right track here. So if we look at a third variable that we can tune in these assays is the affinity of the TCR for its peptide HLA complex. So it's been shown that antiviral T cells tend to have uh, T cell receptors that are of a higher affinity um, for their peptide HLA than TCRs that are specific for tumor neoepitopes. So to try and make this model a bit more relevant to endogenous anti-tumor T cells, we tested whether we could modify the viral peptide epitope being presented by the tumor cell in a way that would attenuate but not entirely ablate recognition by the antiviral T cell. Now this can be a tricky endeavor as T cells tend to be exquisitely sensitive um, to, to even small changes in their peptide. Um, but sometimes changes can be tolerated. And I'll spare you all the background of the screening that we did to identify a peptide and an altered peptide ligand, but in, in this small curve here, using soluble peptide of the wild-type epitope here in orange, uh, we see with this altered peptide ligand that just has a single point mutation in the peptide, um, we, we, we have a, a blunted uh, cytotoxicity profile here. So what we next did um, is we generated two new cell lines that express the mutant peptide at either a high antigen density or at low antigen density um, using the same two lentiviral promoters that we've used al already. So if we start off, um, here I'm, I'm just showing two effector to target ratios, this time stacked vertically. Um, and again, if we have high antigen density with the native wild-type uh, peptide sequence, we don't see any effects of our anti pdl one treatment. If we then um, have low antigen density and low antigen presentation uh, and a suboptimal e, &T, uh, e to T, we can now uh, show a pretty clear effect of pdl one blockade in, in this context. Now, if we switch to using an altered peptide ligand, while driven at uh, high expression by the lentiviral promoter, uh, we still get very weak baseline killing here, but, we, uh, but we're able to, get a, to generate a very uh, potent response using the anti pd one antibody. Uh, but this is E to T dependent, and this is lost at, at the next lower E to T. And if we combine these two variables and have low antigen expression, of the altered peptide ligand, uh, we lose reactivity almost entirely. And even with checkpoint blockade here of anti pdl one we get only a very weak response uh, at the higher E to T. Now, each donor um, will respond to this altered peptide ligand in a, a, a different way. Um, but with it, in our hands, we tested six different donors uh, against this. and all but one still reacted to the altered peptide ligand, and, and whether they responded more strongly to the altered peptide ligand at high density or the wild-type peptide at low density was donor-dependent. 
Ah, excuse me. All right. So I'm going to change gears a little bit here um, and turn a little, a little bit towards uh, trying to multiplex some of these readouts uh, using the eSight um, that Yama alluded to before. Now the eSight is a new instrument. Um, it combines the impedance of the excelligence with um, some real-time three-channel fluorescent and bright field imaging of the same wells. So this really allows you to maximize your orthogonal readouts to give a more complete picture of what's happening in your assay. And these are some example images from the ASEA website um, that, that I put in the presentation here. So one of the things that we've been interested in looking at uh, was the kinetics of interferon gamma production in the course of our killing assays. Uh, we, we would often harvest supernatants at the end and look for endpoint uh, interferon gamma production, but we thought this could provide an interesting platform to, um, to look at interferon gamma being produced in, in real time. So what we chose to do uh, was to use a STAT1 responsive element that could drive expression of a fluorescent protein. So in this context, in this case, we used M-cherry, so that when the T cell uh, engages its antigen, produces interferon gamma, this cell is, is going to die, but this cell that hasn't yet been killed but has seen interferon gamma will, um, if it has a STAT1 responsive element, produce M-cherry and turn red. And we would be able to visualize uh, interferon gamma production uh, in, in, in real time. So if you look at how, how the cells respond, I'm going to show you a movie here, we can watch um, as the tumor cells begin adhering over the first 24 hours of, of the imaging. And when we add interferon gamma, we can start to see M-cherry um, being expressed over time. Now we see some heterogeneity within the cells. Let me see if I can play that again. There we go. Um, and I think this has to do with that these, uh, these cells that we're working with here are just a, a, a mixed pool. Um, I think if we did some, some cloning, we'd get a really nice homogenous response. But this is a pretty clear signal for us to begin working with. So if you look at the kinetics um, of this M-cherry being produced uh, and, and quantitation over time, we see a nice dose response that begins several hours after the addition of the, the cytokine uh, and continues to increase for about 40 to 50 hours um, and, um, and then it, it plateaus. Um, and when looking at a, a titration of interferon gamma, we, we see a nice titration of the, the signal, but not a terribly wide dynamic range. If you look at our, our bottom concentration of interferon gamma is uh, around 60 picogram per mil, uh, which still gives a very clear signal above our, uh, our background here. Um, but it may not be terribly quantitative for uh, extrapolating concentrations out of a, a given well uh, in, in, in by means of like a standard curve or something. Um, but what we wanted to, to do next was try and multiplex this in our killing assays. Um, and we also wanted to add in uh, a third readout uh, for dead and dying tumor cells. Um, and this would allow us um, for to have a, a reading of tumor cell death independent of the impedance, uh, so we can compare the, these readouts uh, as well. And for this, we chose a, a fluorescent substrate uh, for cleave caspase 3. Um, and when a tumor cell, or any cell rather, killed, um, in this context, the T cell will produce interferon gamma, turn adjacent cells red, um, this cell will, will die, uh, activate caspase 3 in the process, and become bright green. Um, so one caveat to, to using uh, a substrate like this is that it's not going to be specific for our tumor cells, um, but it will uh, give us a good indication of um, the uh, quantity of, of cells that are dying in the well. Now, t some T cells will die over the course of this assay, but from a practical standpoint, T cells uh, 
uh, are actually a lot smaller than our, our tumor cells, and it's pretty straightforward within the analysis algorithm to exclude small green uh, dead cells from the, the much larger green tumor cells. So if we look at what happens um, when we start putting all these pieces together, let's see if this movie will start going. Again, we, we, we have our, our tumor cells adhering over the first 24 hours, and our T cells and descend upon them and, and start killing tumor cells, and we see this uh, f at first gradual and then pretty uh, rapid increase in in dead tumor cells, green caspase three positive, uh, dead and dying tumor cells, as well as the red M cherry um, signal coming up. Let me play this again. Go. So we have a nice uh, accumulation of, of dying tumor cells, pretty, a pretty complete clearing in this example of uh, tumor cells from the well. So if we look at the multiplex um, readouts across effector to target ratios, and here I'm showing data from three different donors uh, run on, on the same plate. And, and these are using the, the tumor cells that were expressing the low density of, of antigen. And so we can see that we have, uh, this is looking at the percent cytolysis using the impedance measurements. Uh, we have a very robust anti-tumor response from, from donor one. You can pretty effectively clear almost all the tumor cells, even at a, a modest E to T of one. Whereas donor two is perhaps more typical uh, we get these more intermediate response, and donor three uh, is actually a bit weaker than we, we typically observe. But, but this gives us a nice spectrum of activity uh, in, in this assay. And so we would say that, 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 that donor three wasn't controlling the, the tumor cell growth very well. But if we look at the number of cleave caspase three positive cells, we can see starting on the left uh, our, our kinetics, uh, they match quite nicely our in, impedance readout. Uh, on the left, um, but as we, we go across over to donor two and then over to donor three, uh, the y-axis scales on these plots are all the same. Donor three is actually generating quite a few dead tumor cells. Um, these are, um, it doesn't quite reach the, the, the plateau level um, that we see in, in donor one, and perhaps the, the rate of killing, maybe the, the slope of this curve isn't quite as steep. Um, but this donor doesn't look to be quite as inert uh, as one might interpret from the impedance-based graph. So there, there's a bit of a disconnect here. If we look at the, uh, the M cherry signal, um, this time um, looking across all three donors, we actually see pretty comparable kinetics. Um, and I didn't know quite what to make of this, um, but if we start looking at um, a snapshot uh, to do a bit more of a gut check um, on does our data match what we actually see with our eyes. If we look at a snapshot in these wells from the last time point, for donor one, really all we see left are small lymphocytes and green cell uh, and debris, uh, so our dead tumor cells. In, in donor two, it had an intermediate response, uh, we see quite a bit of red left behind, and I don't know, I'm not sure how well the, um, uh, the bright field imaging is going to transmit, but, but there are regions where we don't see any tumor cells on, on the right and on the left part of this image, but, but the bottom and center still have substantial uh, confluent tumor cells. And in donor three, still have pretty intense red and cherry signal here indicating that we do have production of uh, interferon gamma in this well. Uh, we do have dead tumor cells, um, but there's pretty much a confluent monolayer of tumor cells in this well. So while T cells from, from donor three um, were able to uh, kill some tumor cells, uh, produce interferon gamma, it wasn't ultimately able to control the net growth of those tumor cells in that well. Perhaps the, the pace of their killing uh, 
uh, was too slow, and as the tumor cells were just able to regrow and, and, and repopulate that well. Um, and uh, th th these are the things that we're still working on on trying to figure out. And so what's the, the difference between these three donors? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you today. This is actually my last uh, in data slide. But if we step back, we have three parallel sets of data uh, that could lead to very different interpretations of what's actually happening in the well. Now, I'm also only showing the baseline killing data. We haven't treated these wells with any antibodies or, or stimulants. Um, when we start layering on therapeutic interventions and combinations, we start generating very rich and dense data sets um, for which we can begin extracting meaning uh, and learn what could be the more important parameters to modify uh, in our T cells behavior and function that would ultimately lead us to the, the end that we seek, which is the clearance of the tumor cells um, out of these wells. So having multiple orthogonal readouts can provide a much more complete picture of what's going on and provide a much better platform for much uh, to make some important decisions based on the data. So to wrap up, um, we've shown that uh, antiviral T cells can be used to model anti-tumor T cell responses, and that by carefully balancing several variables that can impact the function of an individual T cell, as well as the net response of a population of these T cells, we can engineer a stable platform for testing of immunomodulatory antibodies and, and, and proteins. And by dialing back our stimulation conditions along these several axes, we can controllably reduce our baseline killing and create substantial windows to show combinatorial activity uh, using multiple therapeutic agents and, and modalities. And by multiplexing our readouts with impedance and imaging, we've already begun making insights into our anti-tumor responses that would be, have been very difficult, if, if possible at all, uh, to make using a single readout system. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank just a handful of the many folks that have contributed to this work, especially James, Lori, and Christina, who helped with the engineering and production of our cell lines, roy -Ann, Vanessa, Agnieszka for generating much of the data for these studies, only a snapshot of which I was able to show here today. Uh, and finally, the guys over at AC, especially Mai Chen, Lincoln, and Fabio for their support over the last few years. Uh, and if I've left any time, I'll be happy to take any questions that have come through. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike, for that uh, really excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we will now start the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please submit it now. And uh, we'll be uh, able to get a, to a couple of questions at the end of the hour. However, if we don't make it to your questions, we'll be forwarding all of them on to Mike, and we will make sure that we follow up with you. Additionally, if you would like to learn more, once again, about our solutions uh, that we offer, please do visit our website and then also click on that resource box that I've mentioned before. So, uh, so Mike, we got uh, a number of really good questions, and uh, let's uh, get started. Um, the first question is, um, how do you balance the density and quality of peptide to get optimal cytotoxicity? Um, that's a good question, um, and, and something that uh, kind of has to be done somewhat empirically. Um, we didn't know quite how we were going to, um, how changing the lentiviral promoter um, would affect uh, what ultimately ends up on the surface of the, of the tumor cell. I had actually feared um, that um, even by lowering it as much as we did, it would still be too much. Because uh, there are r reports in the literature that T cells are able to detect as as few as one or two uh, peptide HLA complexes on a tumor cell. Um, but uh, we've we have some efforts trying to quantify the, the, the number of peptides that are actually being presented on, on the cells. But I, I'm not able to share that data here today. Um, uh, and so the, the the short answer is we we try and do both. Um, I, I think um, 
based on our data that the most uh, linear and dynamic conditions are um, poor antigen quality at high density uh, or, or native uh, antigen quality at low density. Uh, those seems to, to kind of be the two, uh, two conditions where the majority of the donors that we've tested uh, show the, the most dynamic responses. Great. And, and relating to, to that question, Mike, uh, someone also asked whether the, your tumor cell line has an equal sort of propensity to express all of these different peptides, or you get different levels of um, expression or presentation. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question, um, and, and also one that's a little bit difficult to answer. Um, as I mentioned, we're trying to do uh, some quantitation by mass spec to see if we can actually quantitate the, the number of each peptide, uh, because the only other way we really have to, to know that there's peptide there is that, um, the T, uh, that they're able to be killed by a, a, a T cell uh, that recognizes that, that single peptide. Um, and given the range of um, uh, affinities uh, of different T cell receptors and different clonalities that, that we're working with, um, there's not a good answer to the question, um, unfortunately. Um, we, it's also one that we've, we've approached somewhat empirically um, and uh, just by trying to uh, change promoters, change the, uh, the the structure of the actual lentiviral construct. Um, different um, linkers seem to have an impact on the amount of peptide that reaches the, the surface, um, and so that's that's also something that we've just arrived at somewhat empirically. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's another question here which asks if you checked for T, T cell exhaustion after co-culture with high and low antigen target cells. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's a very good question. Um, and there are some folks within our research group um, that are trying to, to study just that, um, whether re repetitive co-culture with tumor cells with high or, or low antigen um, will result in T cell exhaustion. Um, and unfortunately, that's not something I'm able to comment on right now. It is, it is certainly a, 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 a good question and one that we are actively uh, engaged in. Great, thank you. There's a, another question here uh, which asks, do you enrich the antigen specific CD25 positive 10, three positive cells before using them in the impedance assay? Um, I have, we, we, we have done it enrichments um, and depending on the relative frequency of those effector cells within the, the population, uh, it can really help you. Um, but given the numbers of cells that we tend to work with, I usually don't. I found that if the effector cells um, are at least 10% of the total PBMC, um, then the number of non-effector PBMC that I'm adding into the well tend to have very little impact on the tumor cells um, in terms of uh, inducing a, a nonspecific uh, or antigen-independent killing of those tumor cells. Now, for, for better or worse, um, this will be different for every tumor cell line. Uh, there are some tumor cells that are, are very hardy and, uh, and, and can happily accommodate, you know, half a million uh, PBMC in the well with them. Uh, there are other tumor cell lines that uh, are a bit more fragile um, and, and may not accept even uh, 100,000 total uh, PBMC. So, um, unfortunately, that one is also something um, that's a, a bit empiric. Uh, in, in the times where I do enrich the T cells, um, I, I, I've shied away from uh, directly enriching the uh, CD25 TIM3 positive. I typically will just do a negative uh, selection for the total CD8s, uh, and that tends to work quite well. 
because um, in that context, I will get um, they typically get about 40 to 50 percent of the the cells after that will be of the effector phenotype. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, so the the specific target cell that you had used was an adherent cell line. What if the target cell is um, basically a suspension cell? How would uh, one deal with that in this impedance assay? Yeah, so um, I, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with that, but I, it's something we're starting to uh, explore. I, I believe ACA offers some um, uh, tethering antibodies, basically just uh, that you coat the bottom of the well with, um, and the tumor cells are then stuck to the bottom of the well um, and functionally then provide an impedance signal. Uh, and you can operate the assay in very much the, the same way. Um, w without that kind of approach, yeah, the impedance really w won't work. You would need to go to, to something more, um, either a, a traditional flow cytometry-based assay or a, a perhaps j just an imaging alone assay. And along those lines, someone also asked, what is the benefit of the Exelligence real-time assay compared to the uh, flow cytometry assay? Uh, can, you, can you just comment on the, some of the advantages or the differences between the two approaches? Yeah. Um, well, c compared to flow cytometry, I, I think it's, it is, um, it's not even close. <laughs> Um, the uh, flow cytometry is a, a fixed endpoint, and, and so you get one slice, uh, one picture in time. Um, it is quite labor intensive uh, in terms of processing. You need to um, harvest your cells out of the well, um, stain them, run them on the flow cytometer, analyze all the data, uh, which can be somewhat subjective. And in order to get good data, you need to either have labeled T cells or labeled tumor cells to distinguish them um, on the flow cytometer. Um, if you have an adherent tumor cell, uh, it's best practice in my hands actually to even to trypsinize them out of the well so you're not overestimating your killing rate. Um, so there's, it's pretty labor intensive. Uh, with the impedance-based assay, uh, you plate your tumor cells the day before you add your T cells, uh, and, and that's it. You set it, and you watch it, um, and you come back and check periodically, uh, but ultimately you, your data is delivered at the end in a, a data file that, that you can then um, analyze uh, once the experiment's over. Um, and, and, and the data is not subjective. It's a, an objective readout. Um, so I, I like that aspect of it as well. It's not um, subject to where you draw a gate uh, to determine where your, your viable and dead tumor cells are. So for a variety of reasons, uh, I certainly favor um, uh, the impedance, not the least of which is the, um, the, the, the ease of use. Great. Uh, so we still have a number of really great questions. I, unfortunately, we won't get to all of them, but we'll ask just one last question since we have reached the top of the hour. So you've, you've shown, Mike, that um, uh, in, with the eSight system, uh, really three different ways of measuring potency of the T cells using impedance, uh, the uh, basically interfering uh, gamma-mediated fat activation, and then also measurement of cast phases. Can you comment on the differences in potencies between the different um, types of uh, readouts? Um, I guess, what do you mean by potency, if I might ask? Uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, in, in terms of the killing rate, uh, let's say, I guess that's that's probably what is meant in this in this particular case. Have you seeing any differences in terms of the killing rate uh, between the different readouts? Yeah, I think, you know, with the, the, the caspase 3 readout, um, you, you're visualizing a, a tumor cell as it dies and it stays there 
um, you know, within the field of view um, for as long as it um, is visible but before it, it breaks apart. Um, with the uh, impedance, um, I feel like it gives you more of a, 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 a net result, uh, kind of where, where the battle line is in the, on a, a population basis. Um, so while um, the, the imaging can give you a, 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 a sensitive readout for uh, killing of individual tumor cells, so it may actually give you a, uh, perhaps a more, a more sensitive readout, depending on your background levels. Um, it, it may overestimate how well your T cells are doing, uh, I think as evidenced by the comparison with, with the impedance data because the, the, the difference between the cast base readout and the, uh, um, between the, the high performing donor and, and the poor performing donor was actually not all that different. Uh, but, but the impedance based readout was dramatically different. So I think having the, the multiple readouts allows you to really triangulate um, what's going on and have a more complete story of, of what's happening. Great. Uh, as I mentioned, we still have a number of other really great questions. Unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to get to them uh, during this live webinar, right. but we will indeed pass these questions on to Mike, and we will ma make sure to get you an answer as soon as possible. So uh, with that, thank you again, Mike, for a really excellent presentation, and then also thanks to our audiences for uh, really being interactive and asking great uh, questions. And uh, with that, uh, thanks again, and have a great uh, day. Okay. Thanks so much.